Welcome, welcome, patrons. I'm not able to really do anything interesting this year for Dragon Age Day, and my more involved videos are still in the works, so instead, I opened up to Twitter to see what sorts of videos you all want to see me do. There were really a lot of great suggestions, but what caught my eye was this comment saying, DAI multiplayer, is there lore to it? And yes, there is lore to the multiplayer, and I've actually been meaning to talk about it for a long time. This isn't even the first person to ask it, so... um. <laughs> <laughs> Finally checking this off on my checklist. Let's talk about the Dragon Age multiplayer lovingly called Damp by the devs. The multiplayer. Now, I'm not going to explain how the multiplayer works in detail because I'm here to just talk about the lore, not the gameplay, but the gist is you are given an objective and need to complete it with at max three other people. That's how multiplayer works. I... You get the picture. But some of the characters actually have a very unique playing style compared to the rest of Inquisition, with the primary example, I think, being Zither, where you actually have to play a combination of like these three notes to cast certain spells. Now, there are mods on PC that attempt to recreate these multiplayer spells and play styles and single player, but I haven't personally tried them. And I think even the mod maker themselves is like, eh, it's a work in progress, so um, your results may vary. Uh, but all that aside, there are some lore reasons why the characters are going on adventures. Now, while these exact missions that you will go on is randomized, for the most part, you're given like a little line about why you and your party are going to be doing the thing that you're going to be doing. Um, so there's a couple different groups you can fight. There's the Canari, Demons, Red Templars, Venatori. There's even a dragon at one point. And in each round, there's like various different quests. It's not just fighting all the enemies. There's like killing one major boss in the arena or escorting some important NPC or collecting, destroying caches or just fighting a bunch of enemies. The lines about the missions are pretty bland. Nothing much to say on them. You need to do the thing for the sake of Thetis or the glory of the Inquisition. Some diplomatic mission. Just really nothing too juicy. All the characters join the Inquisition in some way and are part of this small team that goes out and does stuff. The real juicy lore to the multiplayer actually comes to the characters, which is pretty in line with the rest of the series, to be quite honest. With you. So we're just going to be focusing on that. The characters. Have you ever walked out of Cullen's office and wondered what the strange, unique-looking characters are there for? Those are a bunch of the multiplayer characters just standing around. They are actually others dotted around Skyhold that no one really talks about because they blend in a lot better. But the ones next to Cullen's office get the most attention because it's the most traffic area. And then there's also, like, those are the ones with the most unique outfits for some reason. So let's get down to the list of characters, talking about each character's backstory. If you don't want to listen to me blabble on about the multiplayer characters, basically everything that can be learned about them is either from the War Table missions, World of Thetis, and in-game dialogue, and the menu text. Dana Dutchy, I think that's on YouTube, has all of the multiplayer banter uploaded, and it's actually fairly short as far as banter compilations go if you want to give it a listen. So I highly recommend checking it out, which I will say if you're going to check out the videos on the video that she made, uh, she has character icons in order of when they talk. But keep in mind that the game was designed to let characters talk to themselves. So there is still banter if two people chose to play the same character. Um, that did throw me for a bit when I listened to it because it's like one character voice saying a line and then them answering themselves was a bit funky, but it they made it work. Now, you don't have all the characters when you start out, having to unlock them by crafting armor from in-game collectibles. It's actually kind of a bit complicated, and I have yet to unlock most of the characters, and I've been playing this game for how long? Granted, you have to like actually play the multiplayer, and I don't like multiplayer games, so that's on me, I suppose. Um, and I really want to unlock Zither, and I'm still mad about it. But um, I'm also not going to talk much about how they play, because honestly, I'm very trash at this game, and I don't trust myself to explain it properly, but also I have not personally played most of these. So uh, let's begin with the three characters that you do start out with. Corbin the Legionnaire. The default warrior character, Corbin was once part of the Legion of the Dead. Corbin joined the Inquisition on his own and told the organization that he was once of the warrior caste, but joined the Legion by choice. Josephine, with the help of Liliana, discovered that the truth was slightly more complex. He took the blame for a murder of someone of the noble caste and was forced to join the Legion. Who he supposedly killed and who actually was the killer are currently unknown. So this is the part where I would talk about the different War Table mission these characters go on, because uh, there is a handful for each, but if I did that, we would be here all day. And at the end of the day, they don't actually say much uh, about the character. So um, at the end of each little character bit, I'm just going to list them out in the corner here, and I'll talk about the interesting ones, but um, most of them kind of aren't. Like, 
they're interesting as a war table mission, but they they're like the character being in there means absolutely nothing about the character. Does that make sense? Okay, anyway. Uh, but in banter between the characters, Corbin is a pretty basic character. Seems just like an honorable man just doing his job. Um, he's he's the milk toast option as far as characters, if I'm being honest. Once this is all over, I suppose I'll have to return to the deep roads. Your customs are so odd. Neria the Keeper. Neria holds a special place in my heart as she has a unique connection to one of the most common sources of lore, and as the basic mage option, I ended up playing her a lot. Neria comes from the Relifarian clan, which might sound familiar as a man named Gisharel wrote many of the codex entries you find throughout the series. Um, I also have no idea how to pronounce his last name, so uh, I am probably butchering it. But Gisharel was the keeper of the clan, although he has since passed. The current keeper is named Alendra, and Neria is her first. Neria was about nine when she started her duties as a first, and there were few other choices as the clan had few children, even fewer with magical abilities. Even at that age, she took her duties very seriously. When she was a bit older, she attended the Dalish clan gathering called the Arlathvin, and learned that other clans kind of disliked her own because of Gisharel. They didn't want humans to know of their culture. Neria was torn about it, but after talks with her keeper, she came to the conclusion that sharing her culture does not diminish it. Only by seeing and understanding the Dalish would others respect them. When the breach happened, she joined the Inquisition to be a voice for the Dalish. In the banter, Neria is a very harsh woman. She openly doesn't get the chantry and human customs, and her focus is just entirely on the elves. She can be a bit rude sometimes, but it's also clear that she is very green in the field. It will be a relief to return to my clan once all this is done. I try not to think about the future. Hall the Archer. Hall's family was killed in a bandit attack at a very young age while they were traveling. The last memory he has of his mother is her yelling for him to run. While he did escape, he only survived because a Dalish hunter named Fenora found him. Fenora's clan wasn't fond of the idea of a human running around, but she refused to abandon the boy. She raised him and taught him everything she knew about hunting. At the age of 14, she brought him out to the woods one day, she handed him a bone and arrow, and told him to close his eyes. While Hall had believed that Fenora was trying to help him fit into her clan, the reality was that she had been teaching him how to live on his own. So when he opened his eyes, she and the rest of her clan were gone. Hall now wanders around trying to help others like Fenora helped him, and his joining of the Inquisition marked a change for him, the first time he belonged and was needed. Um, in the banter, Hall is a quiet but very kind man. Um, the, the best way to describe him would be that he gives off the biggest I am a sad man and need to be held energy, which I'm kind of a fan of. There are so many people in the world. I'm not used to the lack of silence. Your hold must have been very dull indeed, my friend. No wonder the lady led you to us. From there, here are the unlockable characters. Aemon the Avar. The first character on this list that actually has a little more going on with them than just the multiplayer. Now, most of you have actually met Aemon in a single player game, but is better known as Skywatcher. He meets the player for the first time in the Fallowmire when he helps steal a rift and could talk to the Inquisitor. Later on, if you finish the main quest in the Fallowmire, he will also agree to join the Inquisition. There actually isn't much on his backstory as he was a later addition to Damp, so he didn't get a cool write-up in World of Thetis, which I will say the release date of the Dragon Slayer update, which added Aemond um, to the multiplayer, was only released actually a few days after World of Thetis Volume 2 came out. So... Um, I guess this with how long physical media takes to print, it likely had to be finalized long before Aemon was finalized. Now, Aemon is an interesting character to play, as while he is a two-handed warrior, he is actually technically a mage, and his abilities reflect that. As he tells the Inquisitor, he is a priest of the Lady of the Skies in the Avar, hence the title Skywatcher, and is tasked with finding her whims and completing the sky burials of their dead. Um, as a bit of an explanation on sky burials, Avar culture is actually a really interesting topic that I need to do a video on one day, but basically Avars leave their dead on cliffs to be eaten by birds. The birds then bring the soul to the sky to be there with their creator, the Lady of the Skies. Now, when the rift opened, Aemon took this as a sign from the lady. He joined the organization that seemed to be helping close it. And he isn't really sure why the lady wants him to be there, but he's just doing it. Um, now, his main war table mission is actually a really funny one. He asked to go see the Avar clan at Stonebear Hold if you have the Jaws on Hack on DLC. And depending on your choices, he'll either show off his strength or share some useful healing techniques. But uh, either way, he ends up really getting along with their thanes, Ferris Sunhair. And by that, I mean they slept together. 
In the banter, he's actually sort of different than in the single player. The voice actor, I believe, is different. And I think that the man that voices Zither, who also voiced Sebastian, but that's another story, um, also voices Eamon. So they kind of sound really similar. But yeah, while he's obviously new to the Lowlands, he's devout to the Lady of the Skies and just so joyful about helping the Inquisition and fighting. I just, he just talks how I would imagine a Labrador to. He's just a sweetheart. The Lady of the Skies led me to your herald. What is Andraste the goddess of, anyway? One shouldn't ask so many questions. Argent the Assassin Argent is named after the Elysian word for Quicksilver, which in the real world is another name for Mercury. Her backstory is largely unknown, but in World of Thetis, it's described that right after the breach, Liliana went hard and fast after people known to hate the Divine. She politically ruined a minor noblewoman named Lady Sibyl... Maron of Benes, oh jeez, I'm sorry, anyone who speaks French, uh, because she thought she might be the cause of the explosion. While we now know that she had absolutely nothing to do with it, and Liliana just destroyed her for no reason, um, but before the truth came out, her son donated a ton of assets to the budding Inquisition in Haven to get them to stop harassing his mom. <laughs> I, I, it's just funny to me for some reason. Anyway, one of those assets was Argent. Some believe that Liliana has details about Arjun's origins, but she has yet to confirm that. There is some gossip that she resembles the noble family of Severn, that she is an heiress or the daughter of a bastard prince, but it's uh, just more likely that she was an orphan taught to be a living weapon. In the banter, her dialogue is a bit odd. It's also somehow not the oddest. We'll get to that. Uh, but it's clear she sees herself more as a weapon than a person. Ryan, who's another character, even has a bit of dialogue in World of Thetis that she reminds him of a tranquil and wonders how someone could do that to a person without magic. She never refers to people by their name and is extremely blunt. And um, she has like this banter about this blue parakeet that she seems to um, remember fondly. Uh, and then it died. <laughs> and it's just like a really weird story. When we are through, perhaps the spy master will turn me over to someone else. Or you could stay with us. Sir Belinda Darrow the Templar. Described as a cheerful young woman, who I would assume from her accent is from Starkhaven, but it's never actually said, I think. Uh, Belinda had met the Divine in person a few times as a Templar recruit. She was struck by her warmth and grace and believed strongly in the ideas that she preached. So when the Templars divorced from the Chantry, Belinda refused to join the rest of her order, deciding instead to stay loyal to the Divine and then later to the Inquisition that fought to avenge her. In the banter, Belinda proves to be, like, the most peppy and cheerful voice on the team. It's clear that she's very devout the Chantry, a fact that is uncomfortable to some others, but she is clearly the friendliest on the team and sees basically everyone as a friend, which on retrospect, maybe that makes her more of the Labrador than Aemond, but I stand by what I said. <laughs> I hope to stay and serve the Inquisition once this war is over. Plan to win the battle first, darling. Killian the Arcane Warrior. Killian actually comes from the Ralifarian clan as well, and he is also a mage. His origin is that he used to be the first of the clan, but when he learned of the ancient arcane warriors, he became obsessed. He asked Keeper Alindra if he could leave to learn as much as he could about the Order, and to learn about the magical secrets they possessed, and she agreed. He left and was eventually able to find an ancient elven shrine that he says held the secrets of the warriors. He stayed there for years, training his abilities, and by his own account, he would likely still be there had the breach not happened. When it was opened, he knew it was time to use his skills for the benefit of Thetis. Now, he does know Neria, but is much older than her. When he was setting out for his journey, assuming he was adult then, Neria was about 10, so he's probably close to almost 10 years older than her. Um, the white hair, too, could be a sign of age, and not just that he has white hair. Uh, he might just be, like, just an older guy. Now, despite his absolutely chilling and ruthless character card, the banter of Killian is actually really chill. He's friendly to the others and just excited to be around people for the first time in a while. So, like, whatever the opposite of this character card is, that is the real Killian. Did anyone try that ham they had at camp yesterday? <sighs> Hisera the Sarah Boss. Hesera wasn't training to become a priestess in the Kune until she found to be a mage. Her lips were sewn shut and her actions monitored to protect her from demons. She lived a simple life under the Kune until she was sent to be used by the Inquisition to help restore order. Um, so I guess my confusion with this is that she doesn't have an Arvorad or a Handler with her, which previously in the series that usually means death for the Sarabas, which maybe the Kune just sort of said, 
fuck it. They got crazy mages over there. So we're just going to send her. By the way, we don't want her back. She comes back and we kill her or something like that. I guess I'm also confused about her name as it's supposed to mean hope in Qlon. And that doesn't really fit the usual naming of those under the Qun. Um, unless she's like the hope that maybe the Qun will help seal the breach. Or um, maybe the Inquisition named her just to give her some sort of name. I don't know. I couldn't find anything else about it. Now, she also has an interesting play style because she has different stances she casts magic in, and the spells do different things in each stance. Now, you can read more about it on the wiki or even the blog post announcing her, but it might be an interesting insight on how Cerebos are trained, or at least how one Cerebos was trained, or it might just be a game mechanic that will never show up again. Who knows? Uh, this is also where I would talk about the banter, but Hysera and Paula, who we'll talk about later, have an interesting twist to them. Neither of them talk. Uh, I couldn't find any banter from others talking to them either, but it's hard to kind of find info on Damp. Um, she does make noises, however, and I think she just uses like the basic British female grunts. However, that's nothing new to the game. They just reuse their assets, so nothing interesting. <sighs> <sighs> This Inquisition must be desperate, recruiting the way they do. Katari the Talvashoth. Katari, whose name means one who brings death in Kunlat, is a warrior who escaped the Kun after he became disillusioned with it all. He fled his unit from the Dreadnought and found it difficult adjusting to life in the South. He became a mercenary, and when the Inquisition put out a call for evil body fighters, he just agreed to sign up, finding some comfort in the idea of being a part of something bigger than himself. In the banter, Katari is pretty much exactly what you expect. He tries to tell some war stories. He doesn't quite get human culture yet, but uh, he's trying. Ever fought a wyvern? I did once. Sold the head for good money, too. Did you eat the rest of it? Luca the Alchemist. Luca was an unimportant runner for the Carta, and she was absolutely fine with that. Low stakes and decent wages. But one day, her boss was weirdly obsessed with his noble Kirkwall named, um, Hawk. Um, and they picked up and just like moved their entire operations to the Vimmark Mountains and blah, blah, blah. Yes, Luca belonged to the Carta group that was captured by Corypheus and attacked Hawk in the Legacy DLC in Dragon Age 2. Uh, there was some sort of ritual that would make the dwarves be loyal to Corypheus, but as she was just kind of a nobody in the group, she was never called. So when Hawk came up and started to fuck shit up, she fled and got stuck underground when the magical warden prison went into lockdown mode. Now, she went down deeper and deeper into the depths, getting lost for what seemed like years or months. Uh, but then one day, she found a mixture of minerals in the deep that could melt rock itself. She blew herself out of the deep, and the newly found freedom was not what she thought it was, given the state of the world. The Inquisition eventually found her and gave her a comfy underground workshop to help her ease back into the changed world she just emerged into. The best way I can describe Luca in the banter is that she is just... Unhinged! She has a pet piece of granite she calls Philip. She broke into Liliana's library and ate a book for fun. Uh, it tasted bad, by the way. And she talks to herself and just like a bunch of other strange things. Honestly, she's just a weird little dude and I love her. She's great. One of my favorites. When I was trapped in the Vimark Mountains, I ate lots of mushrooms. Paula the Silent Sister so Paula is technically a warrior, but has a blend of abilities that make her similar to a rogue as well. She is part of the Silent Sisters, first seen in Dragon Age Origins. They are an order of female warriors who follow the footstep of Paragon Asith the Grey. When getting membership, they cut out their own tongue to show the dedication to the art of war. When Paula learned of what happened on the surface during the events of Inquisition, she gladly accepted exile and the loss of her caste to join. Okay, so this doesn't really say anything about Paula, but in the novel The Calling, it has a character that is a silent sister called Utha. Yes, that Utha from Awakening. Now, while she cannot talk, she still has a lot to say, using a sort of sign language to communicate. While Inquisition just did not have the budget for Paula to start whipping out ASL or something similar, it's likely that she would know and perhaps use a lot of this Dwarven sign language. Now, like Hysera, she doesn't talk either, so there's no banter to talk about. Unlike Hysera, however, she doesn't even make any grunts. She is completely silent. Hence, I guess the name Silent Sister. Well, how's everyone doing today? Ryan the Elementalist. Ryan might be an interesting character for you human mages out there because he also came from the Oswist Circle and might even know your Inquisitor. Rumor has it he came from a rich family, but he refuses to answer any questions about them and has no connection to them at all. 
He was one of the first the Oswick Circle to join the Mage Rebellion, but after seeing all the destruction his peers caused to innocent people, he began to wonder if a compromise might be the better way for mages, as the non-mages of Thetis only began to fear him and this caused more. When the Conclave happened, he joined the Inquisition as he saw it as the last hope for his kind. Now, Ryan is actually pretty funny in the banter, not really for his jokes, but more so the way he plays off the others. To me, he comes across as a teenage boy who's like loud and cracking jokes and trying to make others laugh, but when he's hurt, he actually gets really freaked out by it because he's just not as experienced as the others, and it's kind of cute, like in a little brother type of way. You know, this Inquisition isn't as bad as I thought. The people, on the other hand, terrible. Sydney, the necromancer. Sydney was an orphan who was taken in by Lord Henrik in Navarra. Henrik was a mortal Atassi and raised her to be one as well. Now, there is a lot of complicated feelings on that, but that's that's another story. Now, she joined the Inquisition because she just wanted to study the breeze, trying to further her abilities as a mage. Sydney is also the first of two characters in the Damp to be seen outside of Inquisition. She actually has a story featuring her in the novel to Winter Nights called Murder by Death Mages. Now, I've talked about the short story before, so I'm just going to direct you there to learn more about her and the plot of her story. But to sum it up very quickly, someone tried to frame her for murder and then she kills them. In the banter, Sydney is probably the meanest out of all of them, openly mocking or making a point to put someone down. In World of Thetis, Belinda has a quote about not liking her, which is... Belinda likes everybody. She didn't like someone. That's fucking... Wow, man. But uh, she wonders if Sydney acts like this because she doesn't want to appear weak. This is ridiculous. Why did I agree to come here? Indeed. Why is you here? To test our patience? Tamar the Reaver. So Tamar is fun because remember the bloodthirsty cult of Andraste from Dragon Age Origins? She was in that! And she still believes that Andraste was reborn into a dragon. Can you believe it? So after the Chandri found out about the ashes of Andraste and went to investigate, they uh, drove out what was left of the cult that the hero Ferelden didn't decimate. While most of the cult either left or was killed, Tamar lived for almost a decade in the wilderness alone, waging a one-woman war against the Chantry that destroyed her town. Eventually, the Chantry managed to capture her and throw her in prison in Haven, but not long after that, just by luck, the breach happened. Short of men, Cullen gave Tamar a choice, serve the Inquisition and get to kill again and taste freedom, or rot in prison. So she chose to fight, and while she doesn't like the Chantry and uh, she still worships the dragon, she gets to kill again and she's kind of okay with the whole Inquisition thing. You know, it's fine. In the banter, Tamar is a firm woman. She's up for any challenge and apparently uh, doesn't eat meat. I don't know how she survived not eating meat, but good on her, I suppose. And she doesn't actually get along with most of the cast, but she does really like Luca. She likes Luca and she kind of gets Naria and that's kind of it. Your Chantry goes belly up, the Inquisition steps in. Always something to keep the same people in power. I'm just a soldier. It's not my place to comment. Easier that way. Thornton the Hunter. Thornton is a native to Ansberg, a city-state in the Free Marches as it has a reputation for being backwater. He served the local army there and quickly gained a reputation for being skilled in stealth. He has a ton of stories about his various escapes, one of the better ones being that he dressed up as a general's wife and ended up even fooling the general himself to get out of prison. He would then move to Orlais, also enlisting in their army. When the Civil War struck, he fought for the side of the Empress Selene and was sent to the Conclave as backup support for the Divine. When that obviously went south, Thornton was quick to enlist in the Inquisition, hoping to use his skills to bring order to Thetis. Now, as a side note, on the wiki, it states that, like, okay, so you know when you start to recognize the Inquisition and you're about to fight a pride demon and, like, there are just these archers that, like, nod at you for whatever reason and one of them is this black guy? The wiki states that this is Thornton. And, like, I'm pretty sure he isn't. <laughs> um, they have the same armor, but that's just, like, the basic Inquisition armor that Thornton upgrades later as you play him. And Thornton has a scar, where this guy doesn't. Now, granted, maybe he got the scar in battle, but he's also more clean-shaven, and he looks a bit younger than Thornton. And after bringing this up to my Discord, a guy named Reno was able to grab some better photos of Thornton, because I don't have him unlocked. And, yeah, he just looks like a completely different dude to me. I, I, it just, I just looks like a different dude. Now, that being said, it might as well be Thornton. Why not make this dude someone we sort of know? I actually really like the idea of the multiplayer characters just being in the background of the game. So while I don't think it's actually supposed to be Thornton, I want it to be, if that makes any sense. 
Now, in the banter, Thornton is supposed to be an older man. I don't think, like, he's elderly or anything, but enough that he talks about retiring in his many battles. Uh, he wants to get a dog and garden, maybe some vegetables or some orchids, and he actually cares about his team and is obviously a seasoned soldier. When the breach first opened, I managed to evade demons by hiding in a snowdrift. Evading demons? I opened for them early in my career. Didn't they lose their lead singer to abomination? Zither, the virtuoso. Named after a type of instrument, Zither, which all caps and an exclamation point to be correct on the spelling, by the way, is an aging rock star in Thetis. He is an Orlesian mage that used to be a household name, playing for packed audiences of both nobility and commoners. But then the circles rebelled, and his Templar slash manager, Alphonse, tried to kill him, and he spent all his gold drinking in Cumberland, unable to land a gig. So he joined up with the Inquisition as a sort of comeback tour. Um, he's actually also one of the few to have spoken dialogue in the single player. If you make Call a Spirit and Krem is dead, Meriden will be approached by Zither for a small fling. Now, he has the most unique playstyle of the damp characters, with you having to cast three notes to create a larger spell. Uh, also, all of his ability icons are references to album artwork. Now, Zither probably has the best banter in the multiplayer, in my opinion. He's basically just one giant joke about rock stars, and it's funny to listen to. He calls Hall Ed 2 because he reminds him of an old bandmate called Ed, and just can't be fucked to learn his real name, and tells Hall that exact same thing. <laughs> he is constantly talking about drug and alcohol use, and I guess he has had more than one drummer explode on him. Um, also makes a lot of classic rock jokes. Zither's like on the edge of breaking the fourth wall all the time, but I think in a way that's great. This is just like that gig I played in Leeds, except I'm sober and nobody's thrown their underclothes at me yet. I'd rectify that, but I have my hands full of daggers. Isabella the Duelist. Yes, that's right. Isabella is in Dragon Age Inquisition and you might not have even known about it. So for those of you who haven't played the first two games in the series, Isabella is a minor character in Dragon Age Origins that teaches you the duelist ability, and in Dragon Age 2 she comes back as a main character, companion, and a romance option. She's a fan favorite that has a lot of history and character development to her, so nothing I'm going to say will do her justice, but the gist is that she is a flirtatious pirate captain with a heart of gold who can't be pinned down. Her banter is exactly what you would think of Isabella, sexy, irreverent, and even mentioning her Kirkwall friends a few times. At one point, she mentions to Neria that she should be thankful her clan welcomes her and her work, unlike her friend, who we know to be Meryl. And the way Isabella says it just makes it clear that even years later, she's still upset on Meryl's behalf and cares for her. And it's just, it's it's quite nice to hear her again and like hear her talk about her friend's in Kirkwall, that like they're still buddies, and it, I just it was sweet. Um, I I do really wish they had brought her back in the single player in some form, though. Oh, also, Isabella likes big hats now. Every time we find gold, I think to myself, imagine the hats you could buy with this, Isabella. Overall, the characters in the multiplayer are actually really fun, and I'm sad that they will be largely forgotten because the multiplayer isn't really that popular. I'd like to think that now that Inquisition is over, all these characters are retired or just having some fun somewhere. I also think they would be a great cast to be reused in some other medium. So hey, Bioware or Bioware adjacent, if you are listening, you did great work on these little guys. And I, it would be a shame that we never saw the light of day again. Like, do th these are great, great little characters. Do something with them again. That'd be great. And that's all I have to say on the Dragon Age Inquisition multiplayer. The multiplayer itself is actually pretty decent. The problem now is that it's kind of hard to play unless you have three other friends with the same system, like PC, Xbox, whatever. Uh, so maybe one day I'll actually unlock Zither. Anyway, do you still have lingering questions? Proof that I'm wrong? Comments about your own fan theory? Feel free to tweet me at Goldathon on Twitter or send, or send a PM to user Gilanon on Reddit. Duress troll. <laughs>